uh, brother Bob, where there you are. My goodness, you got a whole road there. Good job, Bob. This morning we had 18 in Sunday school. Uh, the lesson for next Sunday is faithful students. Study focus. The church functions best when believers willingly share their understanding with others. We had a good service this morning. Good, good lesson this morning. We have a good lesson next week. Hope everyone will show up next week and enjoy the Sunday school. Amen. Pray for us. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Mm -hmm. All right. If there are no other announcements, let us stand together as we go to the Lord and spend a prayer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, we have asked you to remember our family. Also, remember Myra's mom. Uh, she has been transported from the hospital to the uh, rehab center at Meadowbrook. Uh, and so lift her up. She's doing some better, but has a long way to go. Also, we received word this morning that uh, Sonia spent the night in the hospital last evening, and so let's pray for her. She's, she's been released and doing well, but pray for her. Pray for Joyce Timber. She recovered from her knee surgery, and also for Debbie. As, uh, we continue to pray for your healing and recovery, uh, your family. Love you all and we're lifting you up. Uh, also, remember the uh, Huber, Huber family as they continue to go through their time of grief and sorrow. Let's hold them up. Uh, Kathy has uh, cataract surgery tomorrow morning, so let's remember her. Unspoken request by the Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we truly thank you for this time that we can come into your house to worship you, and praise you, to fellowship one with another. Lord, that you can minister to us today through, through music, through your word. We thank you for Brother Donnie and Marty for making their travels this way, showing your friendship and love to us. We just thank you from the bottom of our hearts for them. Father, for each one that's made their way here today, may you open up the windows of heaven and pour out your blessings upon each and every one. Fill us, Lord, in such a such a way that we're overflowing and our hearts and our love and our joy will be touching those around us. Father, we pray for Myra's mom today and asking, Lord, that you help her, may you touch her, and Lord, may she feel your presence there, right there in the room. Father, we pray for Kathy. We, we ask, Lord, that you help her and calm her, Lord, for her son. Lord, we are sorrowful that she was ill yesterday, but we're so thankful for her touch and for your grace and your mercy upon her life. We pray, Lord, for the Huber family and asking God that you help them through this great time of sorrow and grief. Lift them up, Lord, in their church. Father, we pray for Joyce Temple. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you touch her help her. Dad and Al, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their lives. Now, Father, we, we just ask that you be with our family today, those that are traveling in this hour, those that, Lord, will be going through the grief process. May you, the Father of all comfort, come to you. Be with us in the remainder of this service. Father, we now will take the offering for your, for your glory. We ask for this blessing. One who would give those who perhaps could not give today. We give it all to you for the ministry of your gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, church. <coughs> all right, if our uh, ushers if our ushers will come, Urshers. we will receive our morning tithe and all.
church and it will be used for gospel. About 13 years ago, through the work and uh, contacts that Brother Mel has had with different uh, people in the music ministry, made it possible for Donnie and Marty to come and be with us. And I've always heard about Don, seen him many, many times on videos and, and the different ways, but never thought in, in my wildest imagination that I'd ever have the privilege of meeting him or being in a, a service with him. But from that time until now and forever, uh, God has blessed us with Donnie and Marty making the trip from Nashville, Tennessee. There's been times the snow had been blowing, and these times they said, let's wait until the snow quits come. And uh, so now we, we wait until the snow quits blowing, but we have a little bit of rain. But, <laughs> but over the years, um, Donnie and Marty have become much more to us, Myra and I, and I believe as a church body. More than just being part of the Christian ministry of music, they have become our friends. And I can't tell you what privilege it is when Brother John and Brother responds to us as friends, as well as brothers and sisters in Christ. They have been so much to us, they mean so much to us. And so this morning, rather than just saying, I want to introduce to you to the highly accomplished, receiving the double words, all the entertainment, Christian entertainment that he's been involved in. All of that is so true. But I just want to introduce you to this point as our friend, Johnny Son. Thank you. 
my mind was just as blank as my last expression. <laughs> That's okay, I don't even know the words anyway. I, I, I used to teach a class, and stage is important. And, and what somebody said, what do you do if you ever get up there singing and you forget the words? I said, well, first of all, remember that when the guy wrote the song, he didn't know him either. <laughs> and second of all, if you're in a church service, all you got to do is just drop your head and do like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I uh, want to thank God for Sorry, I didn't know. So I was in the the weekend. I got a call the other day. You know, preachers, they got a distinctive voice when they're official. Brother Creel called me. He just said, Hi, this is Claude. Give me a call. <laughs> this time he was in his little boy voice. He said, uh, God, I didn't need you to talk to me. So I, first thing I said, He's resigned the church. <laughs> <laughs> He's moving to another town. <laughs> My wife said, no mail guy. Neither one of them happened, but the mother superior is now celebrating her first anniversary of the first week in heaven. And uh, our city just goes out to family. Prayers are many. It's a loss for the church. It's a loss for us because she's been a friend. But the good news is she's doing much better today than we are. She didn't have to eat no breakfast. She didn't have to worry about fixing her hair. Everything is lovely. Yeah. But it's good to be with you folks. Thank you for the years of friendship. I was thinking this morning, which is very unusual for me. First of all, I saw something today. I want y'all to know y'all might even know y'all have. I have never seen it in Indiana. But today we were standing down the interstate there was a field that had been plowed. And it had a hill in it. Percy's going to build a body in that hill. I don't know. <laughs> but I was thinking this morning about my years in the ministry. When I, when I first started in the ministry, I, uh, I couldn't even spell ministry. I, I remember one, I was preaching one Sunday morning, I was preaching getting, getting out of bondage. And uh, I was back at that point when I began to preach on the children of Egypt. Instead of the children of Israel. Oh, no. The children of Egypt being led by a cloud of fire by night, a cloud of dust by day. <laughs> I went door to door with my husband. This is the truth. I went door to door with this one time. Right after I went into the ministry. And I knocked on this door. And this woman came to the door. And I was a single pastor. This woman came to the door and had on enough clothes to wash out. <laughs> she said, yes. I said, uh, I'm a pastor so-and-so from such and such a church. And I want to ask you the most important question in my life. And I looked at her and I said, is your blood covered by the sins of Christ? It's amazing what you do when you first start. Ever since I've been in the ministry, I wanted to be, I wanted to impress Paul. I went to the seminary and got a PhD so that I could impress them. <clears throat> now they don't call me Dr. Summer, they call me Dr. Foreman Ellis Packard But God has always used to the children's church. He never would let me do that fancy because I guess he thought I'd get to be here. So all of my entire ministry has been very homespun, very childlike, and very southern, holy. And I was thinking about that this morning. And I was reminded of the fact that when I used to teach quartet training, and I did it for 14 years straight every summer for three weeks, I did teach class in quartet training and in songwriting. And one of the points I always stood. <coughs> Don't ever try to sing a song and make it believable, or write a song and make it believable, unless you've done it. 
If you've never been in jail and you're a country life, there ain't no way you're going to ride a good jail ride. And if your life has never ever run off with a next door neighbor, you've never pulled out a boat of love song. If you haven't experienced it, you can talk about it, you can make it up, but it's not going to be you. It's not going to come out as a blue. And a long time ago, I decided that the only thing I got to talk about is me. I walk around with Jesus lived. I read the Bible, memorized the whole message. But I can prove it. I, I, I got my daddy's ministry, 60 year ministry. None of it relates to me, because I didn't live what my daddy lived. I didn't walk in his shoes for those 60 years. The only thing I can talk about is me. But I know me. I was telling my, my son the other day about how it appears that in my old age I have got what they call lack of days. Y'all ever heard that word? Down, in, down when you're young, it's called sticking your head in the dirt. When you get old, it's called lack of days. And I said, no, I'm not lack of days. There's nothing that bothers you anymore. I said, well, everything that can possibly bother a human being has already bothered me numerous times. And somehow I've been able to survive and get past it. And so the things that used to bother me, the things that I used to worry about, I've seen how they all turn out. And there came nothing new coming down my road. So if one of those pops up over here, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to look at how this one turned out and assume that was going to do the same thing. I can only tell you where I've been and what has happened in my life. And I am one of the most blessed men that I know of the person. I have been in more holes and gotten out of it successfully than you could possibly imagine. I, I, I just wrote another book. And I've got a lot of quotes in there that I've made up over the years, kind of homespun, joking kind of quotes. And one of the quotes I put in there was, success is getting out of a hole without getting dirt on <laughs> I have been in a lot of those holes, but I have never been in one where the grace of my Heavenly Father did somewhere build me a ladder to get me to climb that. When I first got saved, I got into some strange theology. If there's any strange theology out there anywhere, do what I do. You will eventually walk into it very quickly. And I got a hold of this, what they call a positive confession. And what it, the theory behind it is correct, the practical usage of it is true. You can go around saying you're going to get a Cadillac the rest of your life, and unless you've got to pay the payment when you're going to get it. You know? The, the, the first scripture that says, what is down in heaven tonight on earth, and what is loose to heaven and loose to earth? That's not what it says. That's what King James said it says. But the inner ear your translation of the Bible, which is word for word without any words put in it, to make it sound like right in our language. You know what it says? For simple. Bind heaven, bind earth. Loose heaven, loose earth. If it's bound in heaven, you can bind it here. If it's loose in heaven, you can loose it here. Anybody else can loose or bind it? I got into that. I got into this positive confession thing. I just went around. Everything I wanted, I just spoke them to existence. <laughs> and I found out very quickly that Jesus is not a euphoric one to be weighed in the face of every situation. Yeah, he never said that we could stand out in front of any problem and holler his name. He never one time said that. He just said, when you end it, I'll be with you. Yes, amen. And I'm not going to let more come against you right there, and you're going to be able to bear. And I will be standing right there in the middle of it. I know where you're at, what you have need of. I know everything you love, and I will provide for you a way of spirit. So that you may be able to endure the problem. I am blessed beyond measure. I've cried thousands of tears when I first came to Jesus. My home had been Richard of Rowan. My kids was living down in Florida. I was living in West Virginia, and that alone was punished. <laughs> it was it was eleven hundred miles from my house to my kids, and I left every second Wednesday night after church.
to a strike through, got there in time to get them out of school on Thursday afternoon. I had supper with them Thursday. I spent Friday afternoon with them and got them all day Saturday until about noon. Then I get in my car and head back to West Virginia. I did that for two summer years. I have cried more on I 65 than you can imagine. But you know something? Somewhere down the road, I've got at least two big school grades for every tear I ever shed. I have been long, I have been sitting in crowds of 15,000 people and been so long that I thought my heart would break. But not one time has he ever left me. Yes. Not one time has he ever forsaken me. Yes. He has gone with me through every battle. He has climbed with me through up every mountain. He has gone with me through every battle and brought me success to me. This time in this place to tell you flat foot and fall apart. The best thing that ever happened in my life was the day I got beside my bed, bus makes the bottom and said, I don't know what it's all about, I don't know where I'm going, but if you let me get my life out of here, I'll tell you about it. He did. He did. And I have. When it cries for its mother, blind the child lies, helpless and alone. Bye. 
know if it was vaccinated, but it's scary in there. <laughs> and it only goes 15 RPMs. With my man raised, my mother has called me on the phone. And she will start telling me a story. And I have laid the phone on the bed, gone to the bathroom, come back, pick up the phone, and my mom still be telling the same story. <laughs> But I love my mom. My mom, if she got, if she got tried for something, there would be enough evidence to do it. My mom would carry a tune if it was back to her back and not to wash her. But some of the prettiest things I ever heard was when I stand beside my mom in the choir when I was a little boy back in 1947 in Bradley, Florida. And I'll tell you one thing for sure. If she was here this morning, I'd bring her right up here I stood her right beside me and I played her some of these songs just the way she was going to do it. Years ago when I was heaven, I still ain't that well. The song was all sang to me and I agreed to my bed. Old and modest and virtual and now in love. She sang the song that I love like an angel from above. I never one time ever drove into Las Vegas. I 
always flew me to Las Vegas. And if you've ever been there, you know it's surrounded by a mountain range. And Vegas sits down in the little bowl right in the bottom of that mountain range. And they got one little pass that all the planes fly through to go to the airport in Las Vegas. And I was telling him, I used to know where every devil was in that town. And the amazing part was we liked the same things. And I used to come through that pass about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I looked down there, and you couldn't see them. They'd be total blacks. And all of a sudden, you go through that pass, and those lights down there, like a big dark laying down there, just shining. And my hand raised, the hair on my arm used to stand up. Because I loved Las Vegas. Then I found myself not going back there in the morning. I thought, I'll never experience that feeling again. And I did. Until I started coming to town. Now every time I get near the biggest recording studio here on my horse dance. There you go. It's good to be in the Holy of Holies this morning. <laughs> oh Lord. Everybody where I look here, they say, I don't know who you are, but you're going to get your videos. Yeah. <laughs> I was at the Walton House one time. And this girl, she this waitress, she kept walking by me every time she walked past the street. She kept on the board. Finally, she stopped and she said, You remind me so much of the guy that's on those naked videos from Donnie Summer. <laughs> and I was feeling my notes and I said, Honey, I'm him. She said, No, if it was you, you would be eating here. <laughs> Uh, everybody wants to hear those Jacob songs. I, I used to do a minute. That's about 15 minutes. Or, I, I've done a bunch of those things. I, I've been featured on a lot of songs, and I tried to get a bunch of them, little bits and pieces in a 15 minute minute. One day my wife came to me, you know, happy wife, happy life. She came to me one day and she said, I am so sick of that game. <laughs> He said, then people don't want to hear their little bits and pieces of them songs. They want to hear their favorite song. I said, well, baby, I've been there at Jesus Club by singing them all. She said, well, just pick it out if you've ever tried to go somewhere and sing. Quit it good next day in bed. <laughs> so on behalf of my life, I'm going to be doing the better this morning. <laughs> I'm going to pick out some of my favorites, and I'm going to do them all the way through. Now, if you've ever seen one of the videos, you know that smart. And David has got something in common. Every song they sing is like the last one they don't get a chance to sing. <laughs> and they try to make it about seven to nine minutes long. Well, my attention span ain't that long. <laughs> so even when I sing one of those puppies all the way through, I go into my recording studio and I cut out about four minutes of it, so it's only about three and a half to four minutes long. But we'll see how we go. Let us start with the before we start. This is one I on my very first video called Joy in the Camp. I wrote this song in 1969 and I never knew it. When I got older, it's bad to make a revival. The night was so different from all the rest. For there was a silent spirit. It covered all the earth. The stars, they have no glimmer. And the moon flies behind. For in death lies the man of the earth. And in a room filled with sorrow, there's a melody price for Jesus, her son, he's gone. There's a little boy 
Mom taught me that first scripture. Donnie didn't know it, but he quoted it. I'll go to the first uh -huh. scripture. And it came to my mind that I knew the scripture. I was in, I had an accident, lawnmower. Lawnmower doesn't know the difference between the feet and the grass. I got my foot under it and cut it just like grass. And I was in a, a lot of what the medical team would say discomfort. But they say you're going to have this point, get ready, you're going to have some pain. That's right. But I was in quite a bit of pain. And she laid her hand on my brow and said, Son, God will never allow you to go through more than what you're or have more than you are ever be able to go through. It says God will help you. I don't know that the pain went away, but I did feel much more comfortable thing. We will get through this. She was not very verbal, you know, like like some folks are. You know, we need all kinds. But just a couple of days before she slipped into uh, a part of her life that she could no longer verbalize, she witnessed to her doctor. Uh, and the doctor asked her, says, Mrs. Creel says, uh, what do you think might happen if you go from the hospital and there's a cemetery just outside, you know, you can sit in your room. She said, well, I will go home to be with Jesus. And says, how do you know? And she says, because I've trusted in him. And the doctor said, you mean being good? Just being good is not enough? And she says, no, you have to trust in Jesus. <laughs> so even until the end, she was giving God the praise. The last words I heard my mother speak came nine days before she passed. It was late in the night, and I said, Mom, I think I'm going to go on home so we can rest. I kissed her on the forehead and said, Good night, Mom. Good night. I kissed her again and said, Mom, I love you. Five words. I love you too, son. Last thing I ever heard her say. But I love you. <laughs> so, thank you, Donnie, for bringing the songs that you have today. They've been a comfort, a blessing, and inspiration. And I just want to thank you. I don't know what all I have to be like, but if God fills the curtain just a little bit, she's got to hear some of the song. Thank you. And so at this time, I, I didn't mean to take your time, but I didn't mean to. Uh, but if our others can come, we'll receive an offering. And this is all for Don. Let's do it from our hearts. We never charge you a thing to come. Let's do our best. Make it possible for him to stay on the road and serve him to get out. Well, let's give him his wife.
two offerings this morning. I asked him if he want my big money solo first or my big money solo second. He said, I'll leave that up to you, so I get my big solo money. Sir, <laughs> it's down to you over there, buddy. You know, I, I bet you, you know, a few years ago, he had a long coat on. I, I tried to trade with him because I, I did an overcoat. <laughs> I want to be a truth about these suits, Pastor. I got up to 140 pounds. I mean, 240 pounds. And I wore those long coats to cover those coats. My wife, she came to me one day and she said, I don't mind being married to an old man. But there ain't no way I'm going to be married to an old fat. I, I work in a recording studio. I have a studio in Nashville. I get there about 6 o'clock in the morning and I leave about 6 at night every day in the home. And you know these little Walmart packs of candy, you've got 18 <laughs> packs in there. I go through four or five of those a day. I to sit there in the month all day long. My son, he knows I like them. Every week he would buy me a 10 pound bag of pistachios from Sam's Club. And that's all I ate. And I got bigger than higher and good. My wife went and bought one named George Foreman. I have had nothing but shoe leather and steamed vegetables for several months now. And I'm down to 190 pounds. I wish somebody would not me go home with you if you're going to have some grease and cholesterol for dinner. I had to go out and buy brand new clothes. And since then, I've lost more weight. And now I can't even stand on the platform no more because I've got an air conditioning man up there. <laughs> and when I stand on an air conditioning man, it just comes right up my leg, through my waist, and right up on the <laughs> That's what we came down here. Thank y'all for the offer. If it wasn't no young, it wouldn't be no me. Thank you. Thank you, my sister. Thank you. But not right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, I was just talking about God and I put more on you than you could bear. I, my sister, J.D.'s, my uncle J.D.'s daughter, he adopted my sister, his brother adopted me. My sister Frances and my cousin Shirley, J.D.'s other daughter, were sitting out in the vestibule, uh, whatever you call that, when the funeral home, just prior to J.D.'s funeral. And my sister, like me, she just kind of quiet and don't get disturbed too much about nothing. But my cousin, Shirley, I mean, <clears throat> she gets a hangnail. She calls the whole family to go to the emergency room. Everything's dramatic. She's a diva. And they were sitting there, and Francis had her arms around her, sure. and so all of a sudden, the morning is there, squalling and bawling to catch her breath. Francis was kind of tore down, and she said, Sir, you think God said he went full foot more on us than we could bear? She said, I know, Francis, but he's pushing it. <laughs> So some of you this morning may feel like God's pushing Some things in this room are more visible than other things, but everybody in this room has got a problem. Amen. That's right. The mere fact that you got up, made your breakfast, got your clothes on, had to comb your hair and brush your teeth proves that you're human, and as humans, you're going to have problems. Well, I uh, wish I could tell you that you ain't going to have no more. But that's the way life is as soon as you get over this one. It's prima facie evidence that you fix the start of nothing. Because life is short and full of trouble. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. I was right in the room when they thought me about why some things were going on in my life. What could I do to make it all better? And I sat there for a while and I got talking to my wife. I said, you know, I just had the most interesting when I was in college, I used to take a class called philosophy. And that's where you don't know anything. And you go in there for a year, you think about what you don't know. And then you come back with a degree, and you have a thought, and got all the bugs, kind of something you never knew nothing about starting. And so I like, I like to take a thought and run it as far as I can run it and try to come to a conclusion way out there somewhere. I 
vragen is dan ook in de post-industrie van wat we gaan doen helemaal laat. En het is zo simpel en zo taalbaar aan mijn schrijf die ik tegenwoordig wordt. Ik ben vrij naar mijn eigen zin. Voor een aantal is het niet volgen. Het is de bar en back is uit te remember. I never one time ever worried about what I was going to eat for supper that night. I never one time, I didn't like my all time, but I never one time ever worried about it. I'm not going to have any riches to put up in the morning. I didn't like my all time because most of them, when I was a kid, was made out of Purina feed sacks. The kids at school thought my name was Purina because they put all my shirts. <laughs> but I never one time ever worried about Am I going to have a shirt to wear tomorrow? And I was a preacher to you. And I'm happy to tell you, if you look up nerd in the dictionary, <laughs> you see a picture in there that says circa 1946. And it's my picture. <laughs> I had big ears. I look like a Model T Ford going down the road with both doors lying. <laughs> my neck, was, until I broke it, was about six inches longer than anybody else's neck around. <laughs> And my mother had not a speck of taste in clothes. Corduroy. Oh, I hated corduroy bridges. I was the only person in school with corduroy bridges and green shirts. I was a nerd. But I never one time worried about having some nerd clothes. Never one time worried about anything to eat. Never one time worried about what was going to happen when the kids picked on me and they picked on me. Only fight I ever got into in my life was when I was 16 years old. Big old fat girl coming to me. We got in an argument. She hollered out, You stupid holler roller. I knocked her foot out of her back. <laughs> they expelled me from school for two days. And daddy puts the theology on the seat of my bridge. I ain't never had another woman. <laughs> but I used to get picked on. But I never one time worried about it more than just a few seconds because I knew that my daddy was going to come in there and tear up Jack because he stood six foot four. He was a man's man. Then one day, I got a real sponsor. I got a cap and a gown and a little tassel. I walked down the aisle. And now I have graduated. I got the world on the straight and narrow. I start doing my sins. Now I'm going to tell you something. 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 Now what I was, when I wanted to be what I am now. <clears throat> the difference was, I began to use my brain, and my brain ain't big enough to fix it, right? but I thought it was. I began to have to supply for myself, and there have been times of extreme financial uncertainty in the internet. I said all of that to say this. You know what childlike faith is? It's just simply believe whatever daddy does is going to be totally okay. I know some of these problems, you've wrestled. Lord, Lord, we're in my, maybe you're lost in sleep, but maybe you should have eaten tears of it. I'm telling you that God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you have need of. And once you have done everything you can do with it, and it still hasn't come together, how about try giving it to Him? Amen. Because His ways are above your ways. His resources are above your resources. He can be all things to all persons never to any anything that he has or he can't do. So what are the ills are in your life this morning? Hope you enjoy the same. Before anything else when you leave here, I hope you have left it all at the feet of Jesus. I was an associate at Snooty Tootie Church in Tennessee, Central Tennessee. I've got Snooty to the capital S. Now you've heard of civil rights, segregation and all this kind of stuff. Well, in that church, they were still saying things and things playing in the South was going to rise again. <laughs> and we 
had a flat bed. It was. She was still there to earn a brand new money. And she came to church here. And with no fight, and nothing to do with brand new money, but she was fired. Well, I love her, Granny. And every once in a while, she didn't buy something in her house to eat. I had to do the cheap so nobody church to home over there. <laughs> But I don't care how high up you get in the ministry, there will always be a point where you would like to go and just not everybody in the congregation to take a slap off their shoulders. <laughs> but you can't do it. And as the pastor of the church, you can't tell nobody how you feel about it. Because they will tell somebody else. You'd be in front of the board, you'd be in the past. But I knew there was nobody going to talk to Granny about except me. So every time we go over there, I just let all my troubles on the thing. We was over there one time, and she was fixing the big people, and I had to go, and I, I had a bad day. I, I, I thought about it two or three times that day, said, Holy Ghost, hold my coat, and I missed it, knock somebody's head off. And I'm sitting there telling the man back all of my problems, like she could fix them. I just get it off my chest. She got up the table. She walked over the house. I don't know if we had anybody do it, but they come up to me. Next time. And they come up behind me, draped over me, and threw that in. She said, Brother Sanger, you know what I think I'd do if I was you? I thought it was going to be some kind of brotherly wisdom. She said, I just need to believe I just let Jesus fix it. I don't know what's wrong with you, all your lives. But may I make a suggestion that Jesus fixes it? That's my story. That's my son.
that anger will hold.
so much. I can't thank you with the words. Yeah. 